Hey, okay, beautiful. This looks like it's going to also use the laser pointer in this. So laser pointer. Oh, see? And so it faints, but okay. Those can't be so weird. That's just about okay. okay. So change it using the fire. And you can also which is this way you're able to Oh that helps. Thank you so much. All righty. I'll grab a pen bit and we'll get going. Thank you, Russell. Yeah. Yeah. I know that this is seven plus eight fifteen and one minute and then the second hour. Should we start? Yeah. Should we start? You want to start? Right. Yeah. Uh, can I have everyone's attention, please? We're about to start. <laughs> All right, so we have Jack today uh, presenting his uh, master's thesis. Jack is a MASC candidate in the Department of Civil and Mineral Engineering at the Transit Analytics Lab under the supervision of Professor Shalabi. Uh, his academic and professional interests include public transit operations and planning, uh, particularly fare and service integration, uh, regional mass transit networks, and railway operations. Uh, he graduated in 2022 with a BASC in civil, uh, civil engineering from the University of Toronto. Uh, in addition to his research and academics, Jack enjoys skiing and playing the violin. Uh, please welcome Jack, and he will present today for 30, 40 minutes, and then we're going to uh, open the floor for questions. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, today I'm going to present on my thesis entitled A Quantitative Method Assessing Intermodal and Interagency Connections and Service Integration at Suburban Rail Stations. The aim of my research was to develop and apply a metric evaluating the convenience of connections between suburban rail stations and connecting suburban bus services. Operate. Um, oh, wrong page. That's it. Um, regional rail and local bus connections can be um, challenging and problematic for passengers, especially in suburban areas where bus services and train services top typically operate at lower frequencies. This is because of longer waiting times because um, with the longer headways, running for connection if there's insufficient time to change between services, and unpredictable travel times depending on if you made or didn't make your connection. And there is insufficient measurement of connections to begin with, so we're not measuring how passengers experience this or how connections perform for our passengers. Interagency transfers can be even worse because there is a lack of coordination and communication between the different operators involved in the provision of services. The objectives of my research are to consider walking times in the connection environment and quantitatively evaluating low frequency connections and measure the connection convenience under both scheduled ideal con ideal operations and the real real time operations that we actually see and explore different governing structures that help support service integration and I'll be demonstrating this metric by applying it to connections on the go rail network agenda of today's presentation, I will begin with a review of the academic literature that currently is out there on assessing connections, and then I will look at some international industry practices at looking at connections because there are a few railways and transport authorities that do consider connections. Finally, I will present my connection convenience metric before applying it to the Greater Toronto Hamilton Area's Go Rail Network that we're all pretty familiar with, I presume. And I'll present some results from that before concluding with a look at some takeaways on service integration governance that can help support coordination between the agencies and services and help address some of the problems with connections that I will uncover. So in 
the beginning, I'm going to take a review of the approaches taken in the academic literature on um, assessing and measuring the performance and quality of connections for passengers. There are a variety of approaches that are taken in the literature to measuring connections. This includes stuff like um, in Maya et al's piece, he looked at um, the journey time variation be between trips because of a transfer when they're not coordinated. Um, Google and Wilson, you'll use the path choice model to look at transfers based on fare and transfer time. Um, there's other more, um, what's the more characteristic metrics that just look at potential connections and not necessarily how they actually perform in with, with respect to the timetable. Um, there's a few connection approaches taken in the literature that I would like to call out into more detail. Lou and Miller in 2021 used a transfer time penalty and mistransfer analysis where they used um, automatic passenger counter and real-time GTFS data from buses to look at the transfer time penalty or the penalty because of connecting from one bus to another bus and specifically the delay incurred if you missed the bus you were planning on connecting to and so you had to wait for the next bus a missed transfer or where you actually gain time because you transfer to an earlier bus than you're expecting to transfer to which would be like a preemptive transfer well, on the other hand i had asked and cedar developed a connection performance indicator this looks at the headway on different routes and the demand for a certain connection based on the transfer type. So as you can see here, you've got transfers where the lines are parallel, overlapping, or intersecting right there. And that was sort of like a, a categorical variable in the connection performance indicator to measure the quality of connections. Um, most interestingly, Jang in Seoul used tap in, tap out data from the electronic fare card system in the Seoul metropolitan region to assess transfers between buses and between the bus and the subway system in Seoul. Um, so what he did is in Seoul, you have to tap on and off of buses and on and off of trains at the station fare gates. And so using the time between someone tapping off and one service tapping on another service, he could work out um, the trend and highlight transfers for improvement. So here we can see um, where point nodes where there are more than 5,000 transfers in, I think, a day. Here there are, are um, more than 5,000, no, more than transfer times exceeding 10 minutes. Here you can see more than 50%, at least 50% or more of passengers at a given node are transferring services. And D is the combination of all those. So that can highlight your worst connection nodes in the Seoul region and which ones should be prioritized for improvements like rescheduling and stuff. And he found that 80.1% of transfers in Seoul were done in under 10 minutes. There are, however, data limitations with applying a certain similar approach in a lot of jurisdictions. Here, you don't have to tap off of buses. There's no, and fare card data is really hard to get a hand on. You don't have to tap off even on the subway. Finally, there's a lot of research on transfer optimization, various TTS, tra time transfer system, pulsing approaches to time services for easy connection, um, where you have all the vehicles arrive and depart around the same time and then depart, and so people can change between them quite easily. There are also ma various mathematical programming algorithms and optimization strategies that have been suggested in the literature to optimize this. And then on the real-time side, you can do holding control where you hold a bus for a transfer. Um, and again, there are optimization approaches that have been researched on minimizing delay for passengers. But I know in all the, generally in all these papers, they don't have um, demonstrate a way to prioritize which nodes should be chosen for TTS or which nodes are the most important to integrate transfers are or which are the worst to apply a case study to and demonstrate why they've made things better. And that's where our metric comes in to hopefully address that gap because we're, we're picking the worst sites almost exogenously or other ways that aren't really demonstrated or rigorous. Um, 
However, there are, I'm also looked at industry best practices across the world on assessing connections because we have seen that there are a couple jurisdictions that do consider connections. And as you know, and I thought that would add to the limited academic literature on the field. Um, so, for instance, in the Netherlands, the majority of rail services are operated by Nederlands Spoorwegen, um, and they report two metrics that are kind of of interest to us. And the first one, why does this thing keep going out? Okay, the first one is they don't operate all the rail services within the Netherlands. Some are contracted out to other operators like Arriva Nederland and Keolis. And so they report, the NS reports the on-time performance of its services at interchanges with other domestic rail operators, but that's just NS's own on-time performance. But there's a more interesting metric that I'd like to take a look at, and that's something that they term passenger punctuality. And they developed in partnership with the Dutch rail infrastructure manager, ProRail. And this uses um, trip demand, again, from their electronic fare card system there, which is the OB Shipcot. Um, and routings from the NS Journey Planner to account for how a passenger's trip is impacted or impacted by mistransfers, train cancellations, delays that may occur on the network, and how it changes from what is predicted, what the scheduled ideal trip would be from the NS Journey Planner. And so this uses various allowances to connect. Um, tap on and tap off times and data from the OV ship cart system to the um, NS journey planner to work out like which trains passengers probably took and stuff. So for instance, they assume it takes one minute to go from a fare card reader to the adjoining platform. Um, you need up to five minutes to change trains at a station, a cross-platform transfer will take one minute, et cetera. And then this allows them to correlate correlate fare card taps because you check in and check out on a reader kind of like presto with the ob chip cart to actual train departures and arrivals and then they can use that to help understand how passengers rerouted themselves around delays or closures and incidents that can happen on a rail network and how mistransfers and stuff affected a passenger's journey and how a passenger's actual travel time differs from the travel time and the journey predicted by the ns journey planner Another approach is taken in Switzerland based on a minimum connection time to change between services. So if you have, for, which is a worst case scenario for each rail to rail interchange. So if you have like a five platform station, as you see here in this diagram, a worst case would be from the furthest end of the connection gear, which is your arriving service on platform one, and then over the underpasser overpass between platforms to the opposite furthest platform, platform five, to the nearest door on the train there. And so the, the time that it takes to accomplish that transfer is the absolute minimum you need to be able to change trains at that station. Um, and so then they you work that out for 53 rail-to-rail -rail interchange stations within the Confederation of Switzerland. And using manually walking it at a walking speed of 1.2, about 1.2 meters per second. They actually manually walk the stations with a stopwatch because this is a pretty old metric apparently. Um, and then they can assess based on that, the percentage of connections where the minimum connection time was satisfied, where someone could make that connection feasibly and comfortably. And this includes connections to other standard gauge rail operators in Switzerland, like BLS, SEDU, and SOB. Um, this uses track signaling system data to understand train arrivals and departures. So it's not usable with um, other services like buses and trams that aren't tracked real time by that. But they apparently use a similar approach to in scheduling connecting bus services so that you again have an easy transfer. And so that highlights the importance of allowing a sufficient time to make one's transfer, and that's going to inform our metric. So using and having looked at the academic literature and industry practice, we see both the limitations of the current approaches, the gaps and the approaches, the dependency on certain data sources like um, fair card taps, and also different approaches that could be inspirational for us developing an, our own metric, um, which are turning a connection convenience score. So we take a step back and we look at what a transfer looks like in general, you're gonna have at a given station connection hub, you're gonna have 
the point on the platform where the trains arrive, points on the other platforms where the buses, where the bus stops, buses stop. And then you're going to have a walk, the walking path between those bus stops and stands and train platforms. And then a transfer movement is going from one route in a certain direction to another route in another direction. So for instance, from an inbound red train to an outbound purple bus. And then the minimum connection time is that allowance to comfortably change between platforms. So you need like five minutes to go from the train platform for the red line to the bus stop for the red purple line. So if we look at this connection convenience metric, the first part of it is a minimum connection time. And that is a comfortable walking time. I used a very low average walking speed of one meter per second to allow someone to get from one plat one connection point, one bus stop or train platform to another bus stop or train platform. Due to data limitations, it's not guaranteed to be an accessible walking path. And then you have a maximum connection time, which outlines your the limits of a comfortable, not unexcessive waiting period for someone to wait for their connecting service to depart. Um, Switzerland uses a 30 minute window for that, but that's for all services in the Netherlands, including both not in Netherlands, Switzerland, forgive me, too many countries here. Um, it's using a 30 minute window for all services, both inner city and more regional services. In an urban environment, waiting that long would be really excessive on like a daily commute to work or school. So a 30 minute window, a 15, 10 minute window or five or five minute window or 15 minute window would be better because you want it to be a comfortable waiting period, not excessive for someone where their service is going to depart during that time after they've already reached the platform for their connection taker, their departing service. So then if we look at this mathematically, a connection is deemed convenient if the departure of the connection taker service is, af is at least after a minimum connection time from the arrival of their connection giver service that they came in on, but the departure is before a maximum connection time has elapsed after that, after they've reached the connecting stop. So after the minimum connection time from their from the arrival of the service they came in on. And then again, with the connection minim, minimum connection time is a walking distance divided by at a rate of one meter per second, so 60 meters per minute. So if we look at this diagrammatically here, um, a convenient, a successful connection is one that's departing in this window, arriving in this window for a connection to a train departing here, or departing in this window for a connection from a train that's arrived at this point again. And then on the other, then the connection convenience score itself is the ratio of satisfactory or convenient connections divided by potential connections over a certain time period, like a day. And so you we consider potential connections, and this avoids counting services that aren't running at all times a day, like peak period only buses. And so you consider as potential possible connection arrivals, this gap here from the minimum earliest of possible acceptable arrival to the time the trains departed. So in this case, you couldn't make the train without kind of having a bit of a sprint. No one wants to run the 200 meter dash on their way to work. And on the other side, you would, you could hang out potentially at the station longer for a connecting bus, but no one really wants to hang out for an hour. So we've applied this here to the GTHA to the GoRail network. Now, in our analysis, we excluded such stations that interchange with the Toronto subway, such as Union, Bloor Dundas West, um, Kennedy, et cetera. And we've excluded stations outside the GTHA, such as those in Niagara Falls, Kitchener, Barrie, to focus on connections within the GTHA. Using QGIS, I identified um, connecting stops that were within a 360 meter buffer of go rail stations that captures all the adjoining bus loops you might have at a train station, such as Exhibition Loop and Exhibition Go Station. And then using OSRM routing engine, which comes from OpenStreetMap, we're able to work out the walking distances using OpenStreetMap between these bus stops and train stations. And we found OpenStreetMap 
quite closely reflected um, real life because it is a user updated map, sort of like the Wikipedia of mapping. And that um, means it's step kept abreast of all their infrastructure changes we've seen at GO stations lately. So the scope of this analysis, I applied the analysis to four day, four specific days to capture how the network is connections on the network are impacted under my metric. So we looked at spring end of term weekday for like school and university, um, which was Wednesday, April 5th, 2023, as well as a major midterm weekday where people might have like exams or classes at university about Wednesday, October 18th, 2023. We chose Wednesdays because Wednesdays are usually typically the least affected by work from home because people might extend their weekend, but they're still going to go into the office on Wednesdays. And then we use um, Saturday, September 2nd, 2023. That's a big um, summer civic event day in Toronto. You've got the CNEs last weekend, the air show, all sorts of fun things to do in town. And then we chose Tuesday, January 9th, 2024. That was um, a major winter snowfall. So you had potentially impacts on the mostly mixed traffic bus operations of local buses that might be delayed by snow or people not knowing how to drive in the winter. You all see that, don't you? Um, now, the minimum this give this analysis gives us a lot of results and a lot of data. So we're present. I've chosen to present them in a box of whisker plots. Um, so a box of whisker plot will highlight the upper and lower quartile range and the median of connection convenience score. We have a connection convenience score for each transfer movement. So one is from a given route in a given direction to another given route in another direction. And as well as highlighting the outliers and range of potential connection convenience scores for each given go rail station. And then the um, higher the connection convenience score, the closer to one means that more of the connections for that transfer movement are deemed convenient under the standard versus are less convenient. So you want more scores closer to one and fewer scores down at zero. Higher connection convenience scores are better. Um, so I should mention this. We consider connections over an entire day for these from 4 a.m. on that day to 4 a.m. the next day. That avoids any weird um, miscounting of connections around midnight because a lot of service trans services in Toronto end after midnight. So if you have the split at 4 a.m., it works out better. Um, so I'm going to now go into some results from the analysis. And the first thing we did is we first um, connection window we use for a comfortable period where you're waiting for your connecting service to depart depart at is um, 10 minutes. Um, that's a common rule of thumb, shall we say, for turn up and go high frequency services where someone doesn't consult um, a timetable, but just walks up and hops on the train or bus. So if we look here, Wednesday, April 5th, you can see um, from it the bars showing the, um, the upper and lower quartile range of connection convenience scores. You can see that the majority of connections are scoring roughly in the middle. A few connections within the city of Toronto to very frequent TDC buses score quite high with as many as 90% um, of connections being convenient for most movements, as you see it, like exhibition and Asian court go, whereas the majority of connections are in between around 50 to 60 percent of connections are convenient for most movements. And you see quite similar results on a weekend, too, which is interesting, even with lower frequency services there and less service. There's typically you see on a weekend, at least um, you'll notice this is a little irritating. You'll notice um, there are fewer stations on a Saturday because Go Rail service doesn't operate on the Richmond Hill and Milton lines and some ends of the Kitchener and Lakeshore West lines on a week end. And then Tuesday, January 9th, during the snowstorm, you see that the, the ranges for the upper and lower quartile of connection convenience scores didn't change significantly between um, what you remember from April 5th's real time. This is all real time data showing that maybe the impacts on the schedule weren't as pronounced, but the impacts of the snow on the schedule weren't as pronounced on at a 10 minute window because under 10 minutes, a lot of connections may have shifted by a minute or so 
connecting services were still counted as convenience because you have convenient because you have 10 minutes where it's acceptable. Um, also, take a look. Let's have a moment. Um, take a look here. Um, we I worked out a um, a Delta connection convenience to capture how connection convenience scores compare between the scheduled connection convenience under GTFS schedules and the real-time connection convenience that actually occurred based on real-time bus tracking and by the from the transit agencies in the GTHA. I should note, excluding Milton and Oakville Transit, they do not track their buses in real time, or at least not in a way that we can read. Transit, that was the data we used for that. So most connections, as you can see, are worse down or far below. So they're below this middle line. So they are the connection convenience was worse in real time than it was scheduled. A few connections movements saw better performance in real time than scheduled. Um, and that is comparing how the number of satisfactory connections between real time and scheduled with the potential connections from the scheduled data. So you can see that you see pretty similar results on the weekend as well. And then we also took a look, that data is very um, broad and there's a lot of data and it's grouped into stations. So we took a, took a closer look at a couple um, GO stations. I wanna highlight one of them to you to just show the range of connection convenience scores you can see within a station because certain routes may have more convenient connections than others, depending on a route's frequency or even a route's purpose. So we're looking, this is from using scheduled transfer data, scheduled data, um, for the timetables on Wednesday, April 5th, 2023 at Bramley Go Station. That's on the Kitchener line in Brampton on April 5th, 2023. And you can see that for the different transfer movements, you got a quite a range of connection convenience scores like the 511 Zoom route. I think that's on Steeles Avenue, I want to say, is pretty frequent bus. And so it has really high connection convenience scores on the bottom, typically scoring between 90 and 100% of all connections being convenient. And then you got other routes that are scoring more in the mid range, like Brampton Transit routes 115, 111, and 13, which is scoring maybe 50, 60, 70% of connections being convenient. Then you got others that are scoring even worse, such as Go routes 30 and 32, which they're what Go Transit terms a train support bus route. So they're a bus route that primarily runs when Go trains aren't running, so or fills a gap in the Go train network because of limitations on when they can run Go trains. And that's means it's not necessarily a route where they might prioritize connections with their trains on because it's not really supposed to connect with the train so much as replace a train. Now, um, this is all this data is with a 10 minute connection window, but that is wasn't a bit of an exogenous choice. And there could be other options or selections for connection window. And we I looked at a, did a sensitivity analysis using a tighter five minute connection window, which gives you which gives you a smaller window during which you are comfortable with your departing service leaving. So you've already reached the departing platform and now you're waiting for your departing service to arrive and to leave and you want it to leave sooner, five minute connection window or a wider 15 minute connection window, which is gonna make more connections seem acceptable, but it also means you are delayed more by this connection than a hypothetical through service, nonstop service where you don't have to wait for the connecting bus. So at a five minute connection window, you can see most connections, um, the, the upper local quartile range of most connections at GO rail stations have shifted downwards. And this is true even for um, GO stations within the city of Toronto that are connecting to quite high frequent bus services like Exhibition GO and Asian Court GO. And you see similar results on Tuesday, January 9th, but even more pronounced, suggesting that maybe the impacts of the snowfall might have been more noticeable out of five minute connection window. It might have demoted more connections from no longer being satisfactory than you saw with a 10 minute window earlier. This, with these results suggest that the connections that we see in Toronto, go stations that are convenient may not necessarily be convenient because we are conscientiously timing our buses and round go trains, but by accident, because if we tighten the window enough below that, 10 minute network definition the TDC has for their high frequency routes that a lot of these major GO stations in the city of Toronto connect with, 
you see that the connection community scores have dropped quite a lot for even Go stations like um, Asian Court and Exhibition Go, where the most of the route connecting routes are like every 10 minutes or better. Um, on the other hand, in a 15 minute connection window, um, the median connection community scores and the range for, of the upper and lower Courts house for each of the GO stations have shifted quite noticeably upwards, um, again, showing that and when you have a little broader window of acceptable connections, more of them will score as being acceptable. But on the other hand, you are waiting more for your connection in this situation. Um, also want to note, 15 minutes is an interesting connection window to use because the majority of suburban bus services in Toronto run around every 30 minutes. And at if you arrive at a bus stop completely in random, you will wait an average of 15 minutes for the bus. So this is a random connection in a sense, and not necessarily showing us that we are timing services around a GO train well. So if we reflect on the maximum connection window, seeing as we've looked at data with 10, 5, and 15 minutes, you can see that you want to minimize passenger waiting time. That is a waste of time for passengers, and the literature is quite clear on that. So you can allow some, you can have some allowance for slightly early and late running vehicles, especially with mixed traffic buses that you see in the suburbs, but you want to minimize your total passenger waiting time. So you want to have a short connection window. On the other hand, a lot, an overly short connection window is going to be too critical. And what we need is we need a meaningful connection of which connections are the worst so that we can prioritize connections for improvement for application of approaches like time transfer scheduling, where you time bus services around the schedule. And so what you see is that you probably want something around five or 10 minutes because 15 minutes, as we can see, is way too excessive connection waiting time. Also, you'd want to consider how um, a passenger's and station environment impacts their comfortable, comfortableness with waiting at a station. So you'll note that we use the same connection window for all GO stations, but if your connection waiting play area has passenger has like passenger information and maybe a cafe nearby or like some shelter from the weather you might be willing to wait a little bit longer than you would otherwise um so in conclusion we can see that the minimum connection times identify go stations that lack or do have infrastructure for convenient connections because you can look at the comparison in the minimum connection times i didn't touch on this directly in my presentation but you'll see for instance that when they rebuilt Millican Go Station with um, a great separation for Steeles Avenue carrying it under the Stouffville Go line, the connection time for the local buses reduced a lot because Go TDC introduced a new bus stop located right underneath the um, Go train tracks. So you could now change to the train by simply walking up an escalator, a stairs or an elevator, forgive me, they don't have escalators, and then walking down the platform compared to walking a block and a half to the nearest intersection where there was a bus stop before. Presents the percentage of connections at for each transfer movement, which meet the adopted definition of a convenient, comfortable connection. And this can be useful for I highlighting problematic low frequency to low frequency transfers that we should improve upon. And then um, this metric is flexible enough using just um, schedule and real time tracking of transit vehicles, so GTFS data. It is applicable to other jurisdictions or even methods of measuring minimum connection time. For instance, mobility data, which manages the um, standard for the GTFS transit feeds used by transit agencies to publish schedules has an optional pathways file that will allow you to specify paths within a train station or hub. And then you can specify the, the time to walk a certain concourse or a certain hallway or go up a certain staircase. And that could allow a more accurate measurement of minimum connection time if the agencies in, your, in the jurisdiction you're and analyzing use that. So in Sydney, for instance, they do use the Pathways TXT file. No agency in the GTHA does, unfortunately. 
Now, as you've seen, the connection community scores in Toronto are quite low. So there's, I want to talk about service integration and how we can help bring transit agencies together and coordinate them and help and support towards coordinated schedules and hopefully improve the convenience of connections for our passengers. There was a few different takeaways from the research and the industry practice on this. So for instance, in Europe, most rail schedules all change on the same day. The second Saturday of December is change day. Having a common timetable change day ensures that all the services change around the same time. And so it prevents a service change knocking connections from being in sync. Um, it's important to have agencies share draft timetables in advance because there are certain deadlines with where you have to finalize a timetable by before you put it out for bid by your buses, drivers, and your operators, and assigning to rolling stock. Um, timetabling practices in some countries, like Switzerland, Netherlands, explicitly prioritize connections in assigning train paths on the network and stuff. So that helps prioritize connections and keep them in sync. Um, there are various governing structures and approaches that help support that sort of service integration and coordination and sharing of timetables that's really helpful in a regional transport network. So one is you can have a single regional agency that's responsible for planning and delivering and managing all transit in a region, sort of like in Vancouver, you've got TransLink. Um, and then they may contract out the operation of transit services to private firms like Transport for New South Wales does in Sydney, or they may operate it themselves in-house or contract it to wholly owned subsidiaries they own to actually do the operations. On the other hand, there's something called a Transport Federation or in German Verkehrsverbund, which is a partnership of independent transit agencies, governments that voluntarily cooperate with each other. And that presents what appears to be to passengers an integrated transit network with coordinated schedules and services, but in reality, they remain legally separate independent transit agencies, and that can be more doable in certain areas. And those examples of that are in Hamburg and Zurich, among others. And then there are various variations on this. It's a it's a more of a spectrum than a than a discrete pod of governing structures where you might have one agency that has exorbitant powers compared to others. So the takeaways for service integration here in the GTHA is that you we we lack kind of a regional oversight agency or partnership like a Verkehrsverbund, which could be Metrolinx, to coordinate services, share information, and harmonize standards. My discussions with people in the industry suggest that we lack draft sharing of service timetables in advance. So agencies may not be aware of up, even each other's planned service changes. And the la and service changes can all take place on different days. So we recently had the September service changes. Everyone had a different day they picked. Seriously. So it can help with that too. You can have a common change that can help keep services coordinated as schedules change. And then finally, it's useful to use the data you have and measurements like minimum connection time and this connection convenience score to see how passengers' transfer experience is impacted, both when you are planning your schedules and in reflecting on the schedules and operations you currently have and in prioritizing improvements. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be honored to take them. Thank you, John, for your presentation. So 